Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. May I have a motion, please, that the agenda of October 8, 2013, be approved as submitted? Thank you. Questions or comments? Thank you. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you. May I have a motion, please, that the items that are on the consent agenda be approved as submitted? Oh. Second. Questions or comments? Thank you. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you. Special reports. We have a new textbook introduction, and here for us is Ms. Lisa Henry. Hello, everyone. It's great to see you tonight. Um, we're asking for the book, Ender Shadow, to be approved. This is a book that is going to be used in the 12th grade elective for the science fiction and fantasy course. It's replacing the book, Ender's Game. Is anybody a science fiction fan, maybe? Yes, so you probably have heard of Ender's Game. It's pretty classic in the field. And what we decided to do was to move Ender's Game to the ninth grade curriculum for a lot of reasons, and I won't go into that, but I can, okay? <laughs> and so we needed to replace it at the 12th grade level. Ender's Shadow, it's actually a really cool book because it's a companion piece to Ender's Game, and it's the same story written from another point of view of one of the characters in the story. So if the students read Ender's Game as ninth graders, by the time they come to 12th grade, if they decide to take the elective, the science fiction and fantasy elective, they'll be very familiar with the story, but it can stand on its own as a separate piece. Um, it's a fabulous story. I'd encourage, if you like fantasy and science fiction, to read Ender's Game and Ender's Shadow, and it should just be of high interest to our students. That's what we're looking for. Any questions? Board members, any questions or comments? Camille? Well, I don't know if this is what you didn't want to talk about, but I'd love to hear what came out of the ninth grade curriculum. Was it a similar science fiction work, or was it something, you know, an older title? Or What we do is we don't typically necessarily take anything out, but we have um, an array of texts that have been approved for teachers to choose from those, depending on their students that year, their student interest, and the different levels. Um, they decided that we needed another book of high interest. Science fiction is high interest usually, especially at the ninth grade level, and especially you know a, a male protagonist, and he's playing video games. So I think the students are really going to like it. This is the first year that we're trying it at the ninth grade level. So that's why we needed to get this one approved for <clears throat> the 12th grade. And which ninth grade? teachers on um, what levels of English would choose that one? It could it be any of them? It's like on, now it's on the slate, so it could be right. an honors class or a... The and exciting thing for us about this is that it can work for honors and it can work for regents. If you're familiar with the story, they have these two characters that talk about Greek philosophy and matters of state. Oh. And so the honors classes curriculum that they developed to work with it focuses a lot more intently on the Greek philosophy because the ninth grade curriculum also goes into Greek mythology. So it has the ability to be taught at different levels of the curriculum so it can work for both the regents and for the honors classes. Thank you. Right, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Karen? Uh, probably more for um, Jim or Steve. Since we approved the other book at the 12th grade level, do we need to reapprove that book for the 9th grade level now, too? I think. No, it's, it's really just a matter of approving the title for use. The grade level um, doesn't matter in terms oh, okay. of. I, I think that's more about just indicating what level it will be primarily used for, just for your knowledge, not for any official legal boundaries. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I just wanted to comment that Lisa taking the reins as the chairperson for the English department at the high school, very pleased with her work. We're looking forward to her creativity and leadership to be able to take us where we need to be in the ELA. And we're already doing a wonderful job and we're just so happy that she was able to step up and take over the opening that we had. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you. 
All right. <coughs> this takes us to our visitor speaking time, and we have one person who wishes to address the board, um, Mr. Fred Shippy, 75 Clearview Drive. And Fred is our representative on Monroe One Bosies. Good evening. Good evening, all. Nice to see you all and see some new faces as well. We've had a very quiet start to the school year, which is good. And our, bo our meetings so far have been short. I think they've all ended before 8 o'clock. So it's, uh, it's nice to get off that kind of a start. Uh, so there's much to say about what's going on. Our meeting's been mostly approving changes in personnel because, of course, changes and, and some uh, property <coughs> issues. But there are a couple things I would like to do. I've done this in the past. And I think it's even more important now there's some new faces on the board. And that's invite you all to come out to BOCES and get a tour. Uh, you get a chance to see the facilities, talk to some of your students, and ask some questions. And that's the way, if you really want to understand what goes on at BOCES, come out and take a look. Don't have to have everybody. You've got a couple new board members. If you're the only ones that want to come out, that's fine. We can do that for you. But I think it's really important that you get out and, and see what we have there and uh, it will lead to a lot of understanding when it comes time to look at this big dollar value on the budget without much to, uh, to link it in. So I extend our uh, invitation again to come out for a tour. And as I say, if everybody can't make it, if only a couple of you can make it, that's fine. But we'd like to get some of you out just to, to see the facilities. Um, as you know, the uh, State School Board Convention is coming up at the end of this month here in Rochester. And, uh, one of our uh, teachers, Mr. Steve Orcutt, who, uh, make sure I get his title right. Who is the director of instructional programs. We'll be doing a program on uh, Thursday afternoon. Now, a lot of people may not be there. Things don't really kick off until Thursday afternoon and Thursday evening. But he's going to be talking about hands-on video conferencing and answer to field trip reduction. And uh, it's going to be Thursday afternoon from two, uh, starting at 2.30 in the Convention Center of Highland Room E. We have been doing some uh, remote video teleconferencing. They had divers down in the Atlanta Aquarium uh, a year ago. I think we may have talked about that or mentioned that with the chance to tie into a lot of students around the country even uh, asking questions. So it's a, it's a different approach using uh, video conferencing technology to create field trip experiences. So, and, and Steve always does a nice job in presentations. So I really uh, would recommend if you can make it on uh, Thursday afternoon to do that. The other thing we have is the uh, e EMCC, the Eastern Monroe Career Center students will have a booth in the uh, convention hall proper on uh, Friday. So from probably around 10 to 3, a lot depends on how the transportation arrangements are made. We don't know for sure what, but 10 to 3 should be good. We should have a bunch of students there talking about the different programs and the idea is to give them a chance to talk to school board members. So that would be Saturday, I'm sorry, that would be Friday morning from about 10 to 3 in the convention center uh, hall itself. Um, I think that's pretty much all. We don't start our budget presentations until November. I will get together with uh, Dr. Graham and we can set up some more schedules on how to talk about things for the rest of the year. But I want to get these two things talked about right now. Um, also, a lot of you probably saw the article over the weekend. I'm not sure why it's reassessing special education because as anybody on the board should know what's been going on in terms of transferring students back to the least restrictive environment in the home schools and some of the challenges that creates on both sides. But uh, we'll, we'll try our best. Uh, so hope to see you for a tour. Hope to see you all at this convention at the end of the month. If, somebody, if you catch me there and you want to sit down and chat for a cup of coffee, we'll be glad to do that and talk about, uh, talk about BOCES or school uh, issues in general. And I was telling Mark, when I was in high school all those years ago, we had lights and we played football at night. So um, I, you can't beat night football. <laughs> so my endorsement. Okay. <laughs> Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you, Fred. We appreciate your invitation. I think we'll discuss it as a board and let you know. And I'm sure you'll see some of us also at convention. Good. Um, any questions or comments, uh, board members? 
Yes, Camille. Actually, I think I remember that in this spring we knew we were going to have one more new board member and we had Catherine, so I'm, I thought we were going to try and do the tours, so I'm wondering what the next step would be for that. Um, and it's good to know that even if everybody can't make it, it's, if you, I think it'd be, it's worth everybody's time who can, who, can, um, who can attend. And I also want to put a plug in of the few teachers I know who work at BOCES, Barb. Um, uh, Steve Orcutt has been doing great work with Penfield for the Futures Project, and he's working, because um, he's um, working with Jim Dozer to set up the, the Moodle software and everything. So anyway, for those of you who, are, if you are going to the convention, I, I think you should go there because that's just another chance to see Steve and it sounds like an interesting he's topic. He's a very talented person yeah. and really puts a lot of effort. He, and he's great at writing grants. Yes. So. Good. All right. Yeah, I've, it's important that you get out and see it. It's, some of you know about it and others don't. And even if only a few of you get out, we'll be glad to have you. And Barb knows that. Um, I would just like to um, go along with extending the invitation to come and visit the programs. Um, I don't need to go on the tour because <laughs> <laughs> I live it every day, but I just wanted to let you know that um, Bird Morgan today did their relocation drill in um, uh, our practice. We left Bird Morgan and we walked um, up Garfield to the high school and sat in the auditorium. Everybody checked in and we walked back. So um, it was, I think it was a little over an hour and 15 minutes total time, but we did it, yeah. The other thing I'll try and remind you about in the spring, I, we, we always send out the notice on what students are graduating from what programs, but I would really encourage you to get to some of the special ed graduation programs. So put tears in your eyes, but just, just to see the involvement of the teachers and the parents and everybody that works to, to get the students through the program and to see the students themselves. So I'll, I'll try to remember you to talk to you about that in the spring, but uh, just keep that in mind. You've got to try and make some of the, the graduations, right, Barb? Yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you, Fred. So Camille, to answer your question regarding next step, uh, board members, if any of you are interested in going on a BOCES tour, if you could please let Marsha know by Friday, and then um, you know we can see what we can arrange for anybody who is interested in going. Does that and if you want to do another one in the spring, if everybody can make it, we can. There's no limit to the number we can do for you. It's important that you get a chance to come by and, and see what we have there and talk to some of the students. All right, thank you. Thank you, and we move on to our student representative. Good evening, Gwen. Hi. Um, Okay, so I wasn't here the week of homecoming um, due to severe illness. Um, I actually made it in Friday of homecoming, still sick, but I Good. was there. Um, so the week of homecoming for the two days that I was there um, seemed very, very smooth. Everything was, was good. Um, I know the holly decorations um, went up well. Um, and came down well also. Um, there's a new policy about that um, to prevent hallway wreckage and also um, to make it easier for the custodians because um, they sometimes ended up cleaning up the hallways. Um, the student council booth at the game, I know I saw a couple people there, um, was a huge hit this year. I don't know what changed it from previous years, but it worked out really well. Um, it was the first time that I remember that we've sold, that we not sold, that we used all the pumpkins. Um, so that was really exciting for student council. Um, and it's important for us as high schoolers to try to like, get more of the community involved in, in high school activities. Um, it's, it's nice for us to feel supported by the community. Um, there was a new addition to the pep rally this year, which was um, Music Wars. I mean, it was Fabry's idea. She's not here anymore, I saw her here earlier. Um, and that seemed to work. That seemed to go off pretty well with the students. Um, I think next year, maybe we need to start a little bit earlier. Um, it was a little bit rushed, but they'll work on that. <laughs> um, five weeks just ended. So first five weeks went smoothly at the high school. Um, I would like to thank the counseling department because the first five weeks is very hectic with people trying to change their schedules and. Um, senior college appointments and senior like appointments talking about the Common App and we did a little seminar and as you get older in high school you realize how just 
really extremely important the counseling department is <laughs> to your future. Um, and you begin to really um, appreciate all the things that they do for us, especially as juniors and seniors. Um, Karen's 5K was this past Sunday, and it was really um, also a huge success this year. It's, I think it's the most people I've ever seen there. Um, I've went, I think, for the past three years. So I've gone every year, and um, this year where there were so many people. I've never seen that many people. It was incredible. Um, there were some really good raffle items. It seemed to be a huge success. Um, future Democrats and young Republicans are planning a debate at the high school um, for local candidates. And we're still working on a, a date and time, but I think it's going to be open for the public. And we really want to get students involved in the election process, especially locally, <coughs> because this year it will, there are a couple local um, elections, so that's exciting. We're working on that together as a bipartisan group. Um, and there are a couple new clubs at the high school, which also is exciting. Uh, I know there's French Club. There's, um, we're starting up a mock trial club again, and the Frisbee Club. So if any parents are looking for students to get involved in clubs, there are 60-plus clubs at the high school that meet almost every day. There's probably like 15 clubs a day meeting. Um, there's always something to do after school, and everybody is always welcome at any club. So. Thank you, Gwen. Board members, any questions or comments for Gwen? Mark? Do you know uh, what candidates or what uh, elections are going to be represented in the debate? I'm actually not sure at this moment. We're having a meeting tomorrow. <laughs> um, so when I get more updates, I will definitely update the board. Um, I think we're still trying to decide the logistics and all of the planning behind the actual event. So I'm actually not sure. Thank you. Thank you. Barb? Will this new Frisbee club, will they need um, a lighted field to play? I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> John? I thought I heard Fred uh, give a commitment from BOCES towards lights. I wasn't sure, but Barb can probably check on that. Um, I was in the, uh, a participant in the uh, Karen's 5K run, representing the board, I believe. Oh, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> but I, 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 I want to comment. There was 260 people. It's the first time I had gone. And um, as Gwen mentioned, a tremendous amount of high school kids and teachers that were just there on a Sunday morning. And uh, it was just great. And they raised... I'm not sure how much money, actually, for the cancer, but um, I, I think it was a great event. And they did have a walking portion to it, too, so I would encourage everybody to try and go for it next year. And uh, Mr. Put Dr. Putnam and I had kind of a challenge. It was his first 5K and probably my 100th, but um, we ran together and we finished together. So uh, we were both impressed with that. <laughs> so uh, if you see him, he did a great job. And, uh, you know, and I think all of the assistant principals were there as well. So there's so much that goes on that, you know, the public doesn't hear about and we don't hear about that's for good causes. I just wanted to reiterate that. Great. Thank you, John. Any additional questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Gwen. We now move on to superintendent's reports. Dr. Grimm. Okay. We do have a contingency. We do have a contingency. We have glow-in-the-dark Frisbees, oh. just in case. <laughs> just in case. So tonight's superintendent's reports will involve student staff introductions, audit presentation, a presentation on the Common Core. We've heard a lot about that. We're going to have a presentation tonight from our assistant superintendent and directors. And we're going to have an update on the capital project, the security portion, a little more detail in the scope and the status for that security piece. And then the capital project in general, a summary of comments from the information uh, hearing and frequently asked questions and reviewing the next steps and some discussion opportunity for the board. We've got the National Merit Commended Scholars have been announced. Fourteen Penfield High School students were recognized by the National Merit Corporation 
as commended students in the 2014 National Merit Program. And these students placed among the top 5% of more than 1.5 million students who entered the competition by taking the PSAT NMSQT exam last year. And there are the names. For our staff, a library grant, Cobbles librarian Leticia Calwait received a Bound to Stay Bound Books Incorporated grant to attend the American Association of Schools Librarians National Conference November 14th through the 17th in Hartford, Connecticut. And I believe, Patty, am I right? Leticia is a first year uh, librarian for us, so. Excellent. Reward schools. Cobbles, Harris Hill, and Scribner Elementary Schools were recognized by New York State as reward schools for the 2013-14 school year. These schools are being celebrated as having made the most progress or having the highest level of academic achievement in New York State with no significant gaps in student achievement. And they received certificates and I did a, an announcement for their morning announcements for the school community. We also have other staff honors. Communications Award. Nancy Bradstreet, our Director of Communications, received a Merit Award for the publication of Building a Bright Future, Excellence in Our Schools, 2011-12 Annual Report from the New York School Public Relations Association. She was selected from more than 350 entries in a closely drawn judging by communications professionals around the country. And that's a picture of Nancy. We're doing, starting a new program, <laughs> which is called the Bradstreet uh, Certificate, because we're starting it there. We're creating certificates and going around and uh, recognizing individuals that have done wonderful things. And, and in that same vein, the Efficiency Award uh, and Efficiency Award, Karen Capone, who works in our business department, is being recognized for making the payroll department more efficient and green. Karen has initiated saving the payroll register to a CD, which is a much more efficient method of re record keeping, saving trees, storage space, and work hours. So she was recognized for that excellent idea that turned into an implementation. And now we have with us Ray Wager, our uh, auditor, and he's going to give us our audit presentation. Good evening, Greg. Thank you. Good evening. My pleasure to be here tonight. I'm going to take a few minutes and uh, just highlight a few things as far as your external audit this year. Uh, please stop me any, any time along the way. If you have questions, I'll try to answer them. Uh, I will tell you that we had a, a very good, detailed discussion a week ago with your audit committee. Uh, some of you folks were there. And uh, we talked about lots of good things. We went into detail as far as your financial position. We talked about your reserves. We talked about long-range planning. Uh, we talked about uh, comments, recommendations in the management letter. Uh, and it was a very good, very detailed uh, review. Now, for the rest of you folks who were not at that meeting, hopefully you got a copy of the executive summary, which is the financial. It's a quick uh, snapshot, a quick look at last year's financial report. You have a comparative balance sheet. You have a comparative revenue and expense budget comparison. Uh, so that gives you a very quick and easy look at your financial position. Uh, in, in summary, what it says is that you continue to be in excellent financial condition. Uh, you have very good reserves, you have uh, very good assets, you have a, a budget, you developed some surplus from the budget last year, you actually did increase your, your equities uh, a little bit. Uh, you also, sh uh, when you look at your budget comparisons, you'll see it very consistent with a year ago, uh, which is always good. Uh, so, uh, there really isn't anything with your financial condition which is a concern. And again, with your, uh, with your reserves, what, uh, what the challenge going forward will be is that um, there will be more pressure using reserves and available fund balance to balance the budget. 
and, and hopefully that process that you go through that you'll try and maintain your financial stability uh, because you have a very good balance sheet right now and hopefully you'll be able to maintain that going forward and you have uh, utilized your reserves in a very positive way. The one in particular is your capital reserve that you've used efficiently by help financing some of your capital projects and renovations, construction. And when you do it that way and you, and you keep your, your debt that you have to issue as low as possible and you generate state aid, that in fact you can generate a positive revenue flow if you have enough capital reserves to apply against your projects. Uh, so that certainly is a very important process if you can keep that going uh, with your available funds. Um, and at this point you've done a very good job of that. Uh, we also talked about long range planning. Right now uh, with the financial conditions and with, uh, with the state and the state aid and the uncertainties and the tax cap, obviously long range planning probably is more important than ever. So we're suggesting schools look out at least three to five years, uh, try to see where the trends are, see, if, see what it's going to take to maintain a real steady financial stability, and that's really going to be the key. Right now you've positioned yourself very well, and uh, with, with a little hard work and luck, uh, that should remain intact. Um, so that's, those are my comments on your financial condition. Uh, you also have a management letter that has a couple items in it. We had no findings that we considered to be a material weakness uh, or significant in nature. They're very minor. They're procedural uh, comments. Uh, there were also two items that we addressed from the prior year that were corrected this year, which is always good to see. And if we have a suggestion where you have an area that might be somewhat of a, a weak procedure, uh, generally that uh, the issue is dealt with and corrected and uh, that certainly is a positive reflection uh, on your whole business office operation. Uh, so that's basically all the comments that I have right now. Uh, is there anything at all that you would like to talk about, discuss, comments? Thank you, Ray. Board members, any questions or comments? John? I, just, I, I know what the meeting last week we talked about this and I, I thought it'd be good for you to explain to the board um, I think it was the the negative liability area that school districts are falling into was it the post employment benefit yes could you just mention that because I think that's an important I, thing. I certainly will it, it, it's it's not a simple situation but it's a situation that all municipalities schools towns villages everyone has to deal with and that is is providing a calculation of what your liability is regarding your retiree health obligations so all municipalities have an actuarial study done to determine if you were to fund that liability how much money would it take to do that even though you can't legally put money aside for it but the requirement is that you have a calculation to determine what that obligation would be. Uh, and I believe in your case, it's like $50 million in that range. Uh, I can tell you that that is mm, probably somewhat in the middle of other schools that we deal with. Uh, it's, not, it's not on the high end, uh, but it certainly is significant, the number. Uh, but going forward, uh, what, what is happening is, and this happens to all the schools, is that the larger that liability gets on your balance sheet, because you, you have to phase, phase that in on your balance sheet, that you will be showing deficit equities. So basically what that is, when you take your assets minus your liabilities, you end up, you will end up eventually with a negative. A lot of schools already are there with negative balances. You're not there because you have the available resources, more resources than other schools. Eventually, that, uh, that situation will probably have uh, uh, a deterrent to the bond rating companies when they see that your balance sheet, that you have no way to fund your retiree health as opposed to your retiree benefits when people retire that are fully funded. 
So your employee retirement system, your teacher retirement system, you pay what they say you'd pay on a year-to-year -year basis. When people retire, doesn't cost you anything. Does not come out of your resources. It comes out of the fund. As opposed to the health benefits, since there's no way to fund it, comes out of your budget. So not only do you have to budget what your current staff health benefit costs are, but you have to budget that additional amount for your retirees. Okay? So that is, and it's what everybody has to deal with, uh, but going forward, it is a big liability, and, and unfortunately with the health costs rising like they are and have, uh, it becomes that much bigger. And the districts that have an enormous amount of exposure in that area, their financial condition will deteriorate faster than yours. Okay? Thanks, Ray. All right. I, Thank you. I Mark? That. Am I correct in saying that we are not allowed to, to set any money aside to fund that? You are not allowed to set any money aside to fund your retiree health obligations. So are there any things we can do to remedy the situation? Well, when you say remedy the situation, you mean remedy the potential downgrade of your financial condition? That and, and essentially mitigate the growing liability. Well, yes. The growing liability can be affected based on your benefit level. Because every two years you have an update of your actuarial study. And they take your population, your current population, they take your retiree population, they determine what that benefit level is, they determine what the costs are that are being paid out for those benefit levels, and then they come up with this liability. If your benefit level goes down, and your policies go down. If your employee contribution goes up and your school contribution goes down, all of those things will have an impact on that final liability. Okay? As I know in, in, in my place, I, the last three years, I've reduced what I'm, I'm contributing towards my employee health. It's just, when my rates are going up 17% for health, I said, you gotta share it. So they're kicking in more than they were three years ago to help offset my cost. So those are the things that can help that, that obligation, that liability outstanding. Does anyone know, you or anyone know, if there's any action to change that restriction? As far as putting money aside? Right, let, any legislative action? You know, that's a great question. Um, <coughs> the reserve that they approved, that the state approved about seven or eight years ago, which is the Employee Benefit Accrued Liability, or known as the Avalar Reserve. Mm -hmm. That reserve was intended to be able to, for schools to put money aside for this liability. And that's what the intent was. I was on a board at that time advising uh, the state saying this was a great idea. They passed the legislation to approve the reserve and then they edited the language and said you can't put the retiree health money in there right at the last minute. The whole intent was to put retiree health money in there. So now, is there any possibility they may pass something? I can't see it happening. <laughs> because what it would do is, is would allow the schools that are, that are really financially sound, that would provide them the opportunity to fund some of this liability, and that money would sort of go off their balance sheet, like the money that you pay to retirement system. And I don't think the state wants you to do that. And the state has, does not have resources so that they could use it. They couldn't fund it. So there isn't a lot of incentive that I see for them to push legislation to allow you to fund something that they don't have resources to fund. That's all I know. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. But school boards, when you get together as a group in a couple of weeks, that would be a great uh, question to some of your speakers. Is there anything going on in Albany that might accommodate that. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? All right. Thank you for coming this evening and for your work with our school district. We really appreciate all of your work that you do with the business office, Mark. If you can please extend our appreciation also to everyone in your office for everything that is done we'll to do make so. those Thank audits you. possible. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, our next report includes uh, information regarding the Common Core Learning Standards. 
the implementation status right here in Penfield. And I'm going to turn the reins over to our Assistant Superintendent for Instruction, Mr. James Pfeiffer. Thank you, Dr. Grimm. Um, before I turn the presentation over to Dr. Maloney and Mrs. Wright, I really want to take this opportunity to applaud them and thank them for their efforts. Um, Dr. Maloney has been instrumental and essential in, to, in my transition here into the Penfield Central School District and uh, the arrival of Mrs. Wright and her efforts in aligning us in terms of the area of humanities have been outstanding thus far. Um, and they, they are quite a, a dynamic team and they're doing great things and they're really uh, having a tremendous impact very early on together with our district. And as we go continue down the road of the Regents Reform Agenda, um, their efforts are very much appreciated. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over over to them for an update. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> um, we're here to give you um, what Jim referred to as the past, present, and future of Common Core. And Common Core seems to be a very hot topic in the media these days. So hopefully we can demystify some of the, some of the excitement around the Common Core. So to begin, um, many of you might have heard uh, referral to the statewide initiatives, often referred to or called uh, the Regents Reform. And the Regents Reform is the three parts that are in the outer circle. So the data-driven instruction, uh, teacher and leader effectiveness, and common core learning standards. So when we take those learning standards in the classroom and we measure our effectiveness through data, through work samples, uh, we get students that are college and career ready. So that's really at the heart of what we're working toward and working on as we progress with the Common Core Learning Standards. And just um, this is kind of the, the slide about the past. Um, just a reminder that the Common Core is a national initiative. Um, it came about uh, the Council of Chief State School Officials um, brought together representatives, um, the best in research, um, higher ed, public education came together to, to write these standards. Um, they are aligned with college and work expectations. The idea is that we're preparing students to be college and career ready, um, no matter what their decision is after high school. Um, the rigor of the Common Core is um, probably what's been in the media the most lately. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get ELA and math specific, um, but they are research based and um, they are centered around what's best for kids in terms of how students learn. So, so far uh, where Penfield has been along with many other districts in New York State and even areas in our entire country um, is we, we adopted, the Board of Regents adopted the Common Core Learning Standards in, th in 2010 and then upon the arrival of those standards um, in agreement in the state were the implementation at district levels with them. And uh, last year we saw the infancy of those standards come through in the New York State testing program three through eight. And as Leslie will move on later in the presentation, we'll hear about that continued rollout as well. But this is where we've begun to see the, the standards implemented and we have them implemented right here in the district already. So our work is really around these, there are six shifts for math and six shifts for ELA. And right now we are knee deep in the shifts. Um, there's, <laughs> um, the, <laughs> The first shift for math is the idea of focus. <laughs> and in fact, if you think of math, I like this graphic because um, to me, the six shifts represent the idea that with the Common Core standards in math, we really are growing problem solvers and mathematical thinkers. So I like this math tree because I think this represents really the, ho the whole of the six shifts. Um, and the idea, I when I first started here eight years ago, I remember a key phrase that was very common was, um, our curriculum is a mile wide and an inch deep. And with the Common Core, we really are able to take that mile wide um, curriculum and instead of being a mile wide, we're really an inch wide and we're able to go much deeper, hopefully the mile deeper. Um, I was working with the algebra teachers today and, and it, as, we, as teachers experience these shifts, and you've probably seen your own students experiencing these shifts, um, it's, it's 
it's rigorous work, but it's good work. Um, students are applying what they're learning. Um, there is a, a very balanced approach um, between fluency and application. That's the dual intensity, the deep understanding, um, the coherence, the connections that are made from grade level to grade level and within that grade level. Um, we're much more focused than we were in the past. Um, in the past, we were very single skills. We would um, work on single skills, and now we dig in much deeper. What have we been doing in math in terms of the Common Core implementation? Well, at the, impl at the elementary level, as you know, um, we're, we've implemented math expressions. We have another training session coming up this Friday. We are working to align the report card descriptors to the Common Core. This is very exciting. We will have a standards-based report card at the elementary level for math. Um, at the middle school, um, you hear a lot on the news about the Common Core modules. Um, in Penfield, we are adapting those modules, so our teachers are really taking those modules and working through them um, and using the pieces um, that they find to be instructionally sound. Um, the other piece at the middle school, we have implemented an additional RTI math period in sixth and seventh grade math. Um, so our struggling math students are able to have math every day. Um, we have seen huge results from this already and we're, what, five weeks into school. Um, at the high school level, this is the first year for um, Common Core Algebra and we have been working on um, the state has provided us with modules. And remember the word module from the New York State perspective means unit. Um, so these are units and materials that teachers can use. And we've been adapting um, the materials that the state has provided. We also have been taking um, the common planning period that um, Dr. Putnam implemented a few years ago. We have been taking that as an entire department and focusing that time each day on Common Core work in our transition. So we're very focused um, within the math department on making that transition to the Common Core. So like math, we have six shifts in the area of ELA. And uh, again, it's asking us to go deeper with students. Um, you might hear things around text complexity, um, academic vocabulary, writing from sources. Gone are the days, really, the, the Common Core is asking for teachers to not you know, take off the top of the head of a child, pour in all the information they know. It's really asking them to have very rich discussions with students to in, in, in student-led discussions, really. Um, right down starting at the kindergarten level and actually uh, the state has is implemented and put in place pre-k standards at this point too um, so we have these shifts that we are implementing um, where you might wonder well, where are the rest of the content areas um, there are math shifts and there are ELA shifts the ELA standards pertain to social studies, history, science, and all other technical areas. So it's really an umbrella for those um, evidence of those shifts to be seen in all other content areas. I had the opportunity to go to a Common Core workshop on Friday, um, sponsored by NISCUS and, and many other groups as well. And one thing that was brought to light was just that explanation again, and, and the presenter made it sound so easy in that when we ask kids to go to college, they don't just read in a literature class or an American lit class or a history class. You know, obviously they're digging in much deeper as scientists, as bio majors, they're reading uh, upwards of 70% of their content there too and writing about it. So there's where that, that need is for that to continue. So we um, are doing many things, K through 12 as well, uh, and looking at full implementation and alignment with the Common Core. Many of our action steps include looking at resources at this point in time. Uh, Leslie mentioned modules, and New York State has put out units for ELA. We are looking at those units. They are at different levels. There are full units that are prescriptive and, and written. Um, what a lot of those authors of the modules say is they're not here to tell teachers how to teach. They're here to give teachers resources on how to be better aligned. So we're continuing to look at some of those resources and we've also worked on um, some common benchmarks 
with the standards against the standards so that we can know where we are in terms of a measurement of our current curriculum, a measurement of our, of our own teaching, and a measurement of our students against those standards as they are newer. So in addition to working with the ELA um, standards and the math standards and the, the ELA departments and the math departments, um, our work this year really focuses on a couple of things, um, working with parents and helping parents to understand these transitions to the Common Core. Um, and uh, our other work, our big focus um, for this upcoming Superintendent's Conference Day is working with teachers of the other areas. So the science teachers and the social studies teachers and the family and consumer science teachers and the technology teachers. So that, to help them understand what's their role, where do they fit in in terms of the Common Core. Uh, this year will be the first year that um, the Common Core Regents exams begin and the Algebra Regents exam will be given on June 3rd. Um, so we're gearing up for that. Um, in 2015, should New York State adopt the PARC national assessments, um, 2015 would be the rollout of those national assessments. Pending Board of Regents approval, every time that we're at a New York State uh, Department of Education uh, conference, they do remind us that that is pending Board of, of Regents approval, but to get ready. Um, and then the class of 2017 will be the first cohort of high school graduates that are required to pass Common Core Regents exams for graduation. So that's our current ninth graders. So that is Common Core past, present, and future. Uh, do you have any questions that we can answer? Thank you. Board members, questions or comments? <clears throat> All right, Catherine. If I may. Um, now, elsewhere, the um, test scores haven't been that good, right? This is what we're seeing a lot on the news. So my question has to do with the subject matter. Is the subject matter itself changing and then you're going deeper into it? Or is, um, I mean, has the subject matter kind of stayed the same age appropriate per grade and then you're going deeper into it? Or has the subject matter changed to where it's um, ahead of where the students are at that moment in time. That, that's a great question. Um, and I think that's one of the questions that the media is getting a little bit hung up on. Um, in terms of the math, there is, there's actually both. So there's some content that what we say has shifted or has moved. So in other words, um, I'll give you an example, dividing fractions. Typically dividing fractions was taught in middle school. Now that's taught at the elementary level. Oh what makes that difficult is elementary teachers, that teaching um, dividing fractions, that's typically not something that they learned in their college prep program. So that's where a lot of the work becomes in terms of preparing the teachers to teach the students um, in terms of some of these shifts. The other piece is um, the questions. And th when we talk about uh, when this, when we first went to state ed and learned about the Common Core, they kept referring to the, these new math problems or the problems that we would see that would be Common Core aligned as having teeth. And I thought, what? What does having teeth mean? These problems have teeth. But really, that's a great way to describe them. Um, they require much more reading on the student's part. They require deeper understanding and application, as opposed to um, I f one of the presenters that I s I've seen speak, one of the authors of the Common Core, he would put up, um, remember those problems that we would do in school, and it would be a page full of computation problems, and then maybe at the bottom there would be a word problem, maybe one or two. Now it's... It's less of that and more of a balance um, and maybe a problem that requires the students to take the knowledge and um, bring in maybe something from fractions, but then also something around measurement. So applying more than just one finite skill. And then I'll let Jana speak about ELA. So in ELA, I think we've seen um, the heaviness of a test increase in its rigor recently. Um, but, you know, going back to the different shifts, I'm going to actually go back to them. Um, what you'll see come into play are text-based answers 
they had academic vocabulary, writing from sources, they're all coming into play together. So uh, a previous multiple choice question might have been, um, you know, students are given three statements and tell the sequence of how these statements fell in the reading. Now they not only have to give that sequence, but then also maybe in a shorter response, explain why the author sequenced those events, why, why he did it that way, what was his purpose. Whereas prior to that, they might have just been asked about author's purpose, period. Not taking that knowledge of the sequence and then figuring out why the author wrote that prose or whatever it might have been in that manner. Um, so it causes them to think a little bit more deeply. You might start hearing some things around evidence-based claims, um, the old social studies DBQ document-based questioning, you know, has, has gone away at some of the elementary and intermediate levels, but some of that practice is really alive in how students are being asked to answer questions and stake a claim and then find some evidence based on that. Gone are the days of kind of what, guess what's in the teacher's head. There's no right or wrong answer. They can stake a claim and then really find the evidence to prove their own claim. It's a little more interesting in their area too, it's causing them to be critical thinkers. And if I can weigh in on that quickly too, the other overarching theme that covers both the areas of English and ELA and, and mathematics is the concept of the implementation gap. Um, you know, the state's mandate was that you know, basically K to eight, we implement the Common Core Learning Standards. We're, there, there's a phase-in option now, as we're seeing with integrated algebra and geometry will be coming. English 11 is coming in a couple of years, but we had to take that entire section K to eight and implement those standards all at one time. And so, what you have is, is they're based on the assumption in, in third grade when you're teaching to the Common Core, it's based on the assumption that in second grade the kids were taught to the Common Core standards at second grade, and they weren't. So there's a gap there. And so another challenge that our teachers are facing is they're trying to get their kids to the level of third grade or whatever grade they're teaching without those prerequisite skills necessarily having been addressed in full. Last year being the first year, they were going from the old standards to Common Core trying to fill that gap. Every year now, we should see that gap narrow as we teach to the Common Core, and it should become less and less of a challenge and a struggle for both our staff and our students. But this, anytime you implement a new program, a new resource, or a new set of standards, you will have that implementation gap that will take some time to close. We'll get there. So it seems that what you just explained is the reason for the frustration and the anxiety. It's one of the reasons. We okay. have increased the level of rigor. We have increased the level of expectations by shifting certain skills and expectations to different grade levels. Mm -hmm. But that gap is, is one of those key factors as well that needs to be considered. And it just takes time. It takes time. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. Gwen. apply to an AP class or an honors class? Do you want to <laughs> There have been a lot of conversations around that. Students have SATs to perform on, APs to perform on, and various levels of, of testing. Um, and I think that the programs here at Penfield are solid. We are continuing to look to align to Common Core and look at that alignment against the achievement rates with the AP2 to make sure you students are suited for both scenarios, but we have very solid programs here too. One of the things I would add to that at a recent conference, they were talking about uh, some of the shifts of the players that were authors of the Common Core, and I believe, don't quote me for this, not for sure on this, but I think one of the authors of the Common Core is now working at the college board. So they're starting to look at the AP content itself to see how that reflects the, the rigor and now that the K-12 uh, preparation that's happening in public schools, how that might impact the college boards. It won't happen um, while you're here now, but I think in the future there will be an impact, so those, those exams will also reflect that. Mm -hmm. Because of the college and career readiness piece, there is that very nice connection. Bar? Common Core special ed, uh, alternative assessment, thoughts, because <laughs> I have some, <laughs> I mean, is this part of it, is this, or is this a whole different, um, because this is something that we're 
doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And just this, uh, the eighth grade, I, I will just talk about the eighth grade. Um, it was brought to my attention as the speech person on the um, team um, with um, nonverbal uh, students that um, they will have to do linear equations. And so the teacher came to me and said, okay, speech therapist, we have a nonverbal student. How am I supposed to do this linear equation? Mm -hmm. Just putting it out there. And what we heard most recently was that um, the alternative assessments themselves are being aligned to the Common Core, correct? Yeah, I've also heard that there's changes pending to the alternative assessment and the process there that'll better align to the Common Core. And by better, I mean the alignment phase strictly in that sense. So one of the things that we've been doing in math, um, Nicole Whitehead has been hired to help support um, the implementation of math expressions. And she herself has a very strong special ed background, having um, taught both uh, the resource room and uh, 1211 and different settings. And she has worked very closely with our 1211 teachers at the elementary level to help them work through how, does, how do I use math expressions and the Common Core with my students in this setting. The other piece that she has done is because she knows um, the students, the backgrounds, the setting, she's also, we've also started working, having her work with the middle school math, the middle school 1211 teachers and work on um, how they deliver their math instruction. So we've really, that's been an area of focus for us for this year, to try to help support them in this transition. Any other questions or comments? Okay, can I go back to Gwen's question? So am I understanding right that for now there aren't many changes in the ELA classes at the high school level? We're just watching because we have a solid program, so is that sure. correct? Um, the ninth grader, the current ninth graders will be taking a common core aligned 11th grade English comprehensive exam. So we are currently looking um, vertically, beginning at the ninth grade programming and looking up for um, really kind of an audit of those programs to make sure we're completely aligned. Okay. All right. And um, also, where is the parent piece in all of this? I mean, it's it's all over the news. It's in the newspaper, and you know everybody looks at Common Core and say, "Oh my God, what's going on? What are we doing to educate our parents about what exactly we're doing in our schools?" Carol, that's a great question, and I think that that squares that that falls squarely on the Office of Instruction. And and one of my goals is to improve our communication with our constituents about what we're doing and how we're doing it, um, including the balance of, of addressing the whole child, but also ensuring that our children are going to be prepared for success in the assessments and beyond. Um, that it's not just there, and that's something that, along with the, the directors and really the entire ASI office, we're working on improving communications, getting our website up to date, getting resources out there for parents. Um, following tonight's presentation, we're going to be drafting a letter regarding alignment and assessment to uh, the parents and the communities to get on the website and increase that level of communication. Um, there is a parent math night coming up on Thursday evening um, that I think will help go a long way toward easing some of the anxieties around the math program at the elementary level. Um, and we have the conversation on education coming up. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking from there, moving on uh, myself and possibly the directors to some of the local HSAs and doing some pr mini versions of that uh, presentation and conversation there. Um, but I think that that is a, an Office of Instruction issue uh, that we are going to be addressing. Okay, sounds great. I'm glad there's a plan. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I'm going to point out one other thing related to that. We've got a conversation on education related to uh, what's happening in Penfield related to the Common Core Standards, implementation of the changes in assessments and response to intervention that's going to be coming up on November 7th. It's a Thursday night and uh, we've got some good speakers and we're going to be formulating a good program that's related to parent education and community education. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll have Mark just tap forward on the uh, presentation and 
We will hand this over to Dr. Sansusi. We're going to be talking about a capital project that has been uh, in the draft stages for many months. And Mark is going to talk about these implications of the uh, security information and this scope of the security piece. And then also then move into the uh, other parts of the capital project to look at it completely. Okay, Mark. Thank you. Um, the, the board's had a number of updates um, as we've moved through the course of the last um, many months on with regard to both the uh, security project and the athletics project. Um, tonight I want to begin with the security project. So uh, there's a lot of tendrils to this. As you know, um, the district had engaged a consultant to go through our buildings and they, they made an, they assessed and provided us with a report on a number of different areas. So site assessment of the buildings, they looked at our, uh, at, uh, our, our documents, our practices, um, where we're at with regard to practice around our emergency procedures, um, and they identified vulnerabilities. But you know, one of the things we expected out of that, and we did, and that we did get out of that was um, some potential capital items for consideration. So some improvements that should be made to our building. So we are still in the process of, of analyzing that. The the um, architecture for our architecture firm is meeting with the principals uh, to review a list of items that was generated in that report to make sure that um, what we're thinking about as we move forward meets with the building's needs, um, that there wasn't something missed. Just really do that due diligence in terms of um, what what should or ought to be done. Um, but we're, we're coming to some um, ideas for key scope items. So. Um, this is again tentative. We're still in process. We'll be meeting over the course of the next several months to continue to, to um, refine this list. Um, but at this point, as we, what we know today is what we want to share with you. So at the high school, and then you'll see, I'll focus on the high school for a few minutes because um, you'll see some of the themes repeated throughout the buildings and I'll go faster as we go along. But um, one of the things that um, has been recommended is that we better protect the key uh, services to our building. So right now utilities come into the buildings, gas, power, electricity at one obscure corner, the one obscure ill-lit typically corner of the building. Um, and there's a recommendation that we address that in some way with some better lighting, some fencing, uh, that we protect our buildings. Um, a bit more than they are now. Um, along that same line, modifying some exterior lighting. Right now, for most of our buildings, this the high school is again a good example. All of our um, lighting outside goes off at 12:30, um, and it's dark out there. Um, we don't have the capability to turn off some power poles and not others. It's an all-or-nothing question, um, and we'd like to be able to leave some night lighting on. So um, the uh, an item would be to modify that exterior lighting. Dress alarms for lockdown. Um, that's the panic button lockdowns, if you will, because our doors are held open by the electronic security system that, that works off a calendar and a clock and lock, unlocks and unlocks our doors. It can be overridden uh, through a computer-based it's computer based, but it's slow, and you might want to be able to close that in just a heartbeat. Um, additional cameras for exterior and unmonitored interior areas. PA systems are important for security for the building principles to be able to communicate to the people in the building. Um, and you'll see that throughout this. Some of the, the one at the high school needs replaced. Um, in some of the elementary schools, they're in better shape, but just need some fine tuning. So that's a theme that you see throughout this. And really what we want to ensure is the functionality that a building principal or anybody, really any administrator, could get access to the PA system from anywhere in the building and be able to speak to all the relevant portions of the building. So right now, at the high school, there's one PA station. You have to be in the high school office to access it. You know, it's not really very functional as an emergency communication tool. Um, and it doesn't reach all areas of the building. It's pretty antiquated. Um, door and hardware replacement, this is really around locks and lock sets and being able to, um, um, in an emergency, lock the areas of the building that we need. And security film at the entry, uh, only at entryways. This is the uh, film that provides um, shatterproof and, and penetration proof glass. Um, just at the entryways, really. We're not really proposing or considering that for every piece of glass in the building. That would be 
extremely expensive, but um, at least at the critical areas at the entryway, we want to consider that. So that's, a, that's the high school. Um, you'll see those same kinds of things with a few additions in other buildings. Uh, Bay Trail does not, has an emergency general, but it's very, very small. Um, what we would like to be able to ensure as a standard, as by the time we're done, is that uh, in our buildings, you know, these generators um, are not intended to light up the whole building like there's no, no problem. What they're intended to be able to provide is emergency lighting in the hallways um, and then lighting in um, some areas of mass um, where we could hold students in mass. So the gymnasium, the auditorium, where you could you know, safely keep children uh, in a lit environment. You don't need to light the whole building, but you need to get them there safely. So hallway lighting, emergency lighting. Um, um, also to have the, the building's phone systems, PA systems uh, on the generator, as well as um, at least enough, of, enough pumps and other related um, boiler room kind of equipment to keep the heat on. Um, so those kinds of items um, I, we think are important to the security of the whole building. Um, Bay Trail cannot do that at this point. Um, again, the utility enclosures, lighting, cameras, the same kinds of things I've talked about before. Cobbles also needs an emergency generator. But unique to this building on this list is the door and lock replacement at the entryway. So if you think about how you enter cobbles, um, we would like to add enough doors and locks to be able to restrain access to the rest of the building from that, not from the entryway, the, the, the vestibule, if you will, but from that um, sort of sort of larger area right in front of the office to if we could restrain access to the rest of the building um, through those corridors we could we think we could improve uh, overall safety there uh, same kinds of things just in terms of you see in the other buildings PA system improvements at Harris Hill it doesn't need replaced this is true at all the other buildings as well needs um, if the PA doesn't need replacement, it needs um, improvement so that it reaches all the areas of the building. Exterior PA uh, capabilities missing in a lot of the buildings. Again, cameras, uh, doors, and hardware. Uh, Indian Landing, um, we would like to create a pass-through from the, um, improve the, the access to that building by creating a pass-through from the entryway, the newly created entryway, into sideways through into the office so that traffic would flow through the main office rather than uh, into the hallway. Um, you see many of the same, again, the same themes that we've been, we've been touching on before. Scribner, they're in process right now for their revised entryway, so that's in process. Um, um, but they also would need some of these other items. So the exterior lighting, same as Harris Hill, uh, the pole lighting, um, additional lighting in some cases on the outside of the building, so the wall pack lights so that right around the building it's a little better lit. Um, again, that same kind of, of theme and district office finally, just a little bit of exterior lighting and a dress alarm for lockdown um, and transportation. Um, not, we're not proposing very much of transportation because that facility remains on our five-year plan for something much more significant in terms of either moving it or something. Uh, but we do believe that there's a need for some exterior cameras there. Um, there's uh, there's a very, very limited exterior camera. Um, and that same idea that we need to lock that building down on a, on a heartbeat, we should be able to do that. So with that, right now we're... Um, the number varies day by day. Um, so I didn't, uh, I'll be providing building by building estimates as we continue to refine our scope. Um, some scope items will come on, some will drop off as we work our way through this process. Uh, but right now um, we're estimating about $4 million in terms of uh, changes in costs. And at this point we would be taking those. We believe that the appropriate uh, source of funds would be from our capital reserve. So the 2006 capital reserve um, has approximately $10 million in it. We'd use four of that for this project. Um, what I, shall I pause there, I think, and we could talk a little bit about security before I go into the facilities? Sure. Board members, questions or comments? Camille? <clears throat> First of all, I just want to say that I think that um, we can agree that the safety of the students is something that we take very seriously and it's um, without if the kids aren't safe then the learning isn't going to happen 
So, um, so I'm glad that we're addressing um, all of these. And I know that you've been on top of it previously, and that's why some of the projects are already um, happening. Uh, that what I want to say about safety is I feel strongly that we want to relook at our goals because I think that we should have the word safe or safe and welcoming in our goals because that, so I do think our project should flow from our goals and I'm, I feel like it's probably in our mission statement, but I, I think it should be part of our goals to create that climate. So um, I get, I, the, I want to ask about the night lighting. Yes. Um, if you could let us know if that would be something that would come on, if it's not motion detection, if it's going to be on all the time, it's almost a bigger deal that there would be lights, particularly I'm thinking of the schools that do have immediate neighbors, maybe the high school, Indian Landing, Cobbles, I mean all of them have neighbors, but that's kind of a big deal if they're going to be a lot, if there's going to be a lot more light in those traditionally dark areas, uh, you know, all night long. And that in the same way that um, you reached out to neighbors for the temporary lights, if there was going to be an athletic event or a practice, you know, how we would communicate. Or are these not, you know, I don't know what the nature of the lights are, and I don't know if they're on all night, so that's what right. I'm asking about. We'll have to have that conversation. I think it's a very valid point. We'll have to have that conversation. It's going to be a balance, I think. Um, right now, many of our buildings have uh, the technical term, and I can't think of a better one to use, I apologize, is the wall pack lights. They're those little, um, sort of lights on the outside of the building. They're bolted directly to the outside of the building and they light the, the exterior of the buildings. Um, most of those are original equipment to our buildings and they're pretty dim. Um, we're, one of the things we're trying to work through is what's the balance around where do we really need pole lights which would have a potentially a neighborhood impact and where's the balance for um, or, or could we achieve the same goal, which is protect the security of the building, and of people exiting and coming and going to the buildings um, by containing the light closer to the buildings on those wall packs. So we're, we're working our way through that process yet. It's not, you know, I don't have an exact answer yet, but, you know, our overall interest there is in improving the lighting around the buildings. All right. Mark. Talking about the lighting, would, and, and to Camille's question, would the uh, would this lighting, when you're adding poles, would that require the same kind of environmental impact study where you're talking about light pollution, light? I don't believe that the, it. Uh, you know, that's a fine question. Um, we've had this um, um, this work um, has been part of the review has been as we've been working through with um, Mr. Primo, the our attorney who handles our. Uh, environmental work and he's reviewed the the contents of this and hasn't indicated a need for a for a more thorough environmental review there would be the need for the board to adopt a, um, a resolution declaring that it not have impact so I'll I will loop back and we'll double check that um, there's no concern whatsoever I think in part that's going to depend on how we decide to uh, attend to the work your mark. Any other questions or comments? Come in. Um, I I know for a long time the schools have wanted an improved PA system outside the building too, like when they're having a fire drill. So, and if you said it, I, I'm sorry that I missed it. But with with these upgrades, would it be for the exterior yes. PA system as well? Yes, as the that's okay. that's critically important. Many of our buildings just can't, just because of the way the PA system is, they can't talk outside the building and. Um, so then, just as you say, during emergencies, during fire drills, whatever, they, they sort of lose the ability to communicate, and, okay. and it's important we address that. Good. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Quick one, Mark, please. You have an estimated cost right now at approximately $4 million, Right. Correct. So do you have also an estimated timeline? Well, um, we, we're aiming for, we would like to be able to, um, we're working through this, and um, we'd like to be able to offer, if we, if it were possible, um, to be able to offer the project at the same time uh, that we offer um, the uh, facilities project. We don't see the need for a separate vote, so um, you know that's. It remains to be seen whether we can make those marks. But um, as we work our way through this process. Um, it would turn into at some point the same timeline that we'll be talking about in just a minute. Okay. 
Okay, and and again, um, you know, I realize this is just an approximation and estimates, but right. Um, I just wanted to give us go a sense of scale as to where we were at. Okay, yeah. and since it will be taken from the two thousand six capital reserve, does this mean there will be no tax impact? That's right. That money is available in that reserve for these kinds of projects. So, and just as with, I haven't done the work yet because we'll want to refine it. Sure. We'll continue to refine, but just as with the um, facilities project, you know, those expenditures generate state aid. This is, you know, in, with reference to what Ray said earlier about use of capital reserves. This is the way Penfield is. For the vast majority of the time uh, in past years, we financed our projects on a cash basis and depended on the state aid to help support our budget. All right, thank you. Um, is that so? Um, facilities, um, we just wanted to include um, um, in the uh, presentation some, uh, re this is some review, uh, certainly for the board. Uh, but some of these slides we thought were unique as we went through to the um, to our public comment presentation and, and haven't been seen by some of our public. So um, if you will bear with me for just a minute, I want to remind everyone of the project scope, uh, which includes renovations to the East Gym at about $3.8 million. That's a small addition, uh, storage addition, to eliminate the, the use of those temporary sort of travel trailer verde boxes. Um, to install better lighting in the gymnasium, replace that poured rubber floor. That's the same floor that uh, we replaced previously at Harris Hill. So it's the same material, the same vintage. Um, those of you who lived through that remember that um, floor failed and had to be replaced on an emergency basis. This one hasn't failed, but is certainly overdue for replacement. Um, add wall pads. Uh, replace the backboards and there's a 1972 air handler unit that provides fresh air to the space that's uh, reached the end of its lifespan. So uh, we'd update that um, uh, with regard to that East Gym. Uh, it's difficult for you to see but this is on the website as well. Uh, this is just a sketch of the area that would be impacted and, and uh, what would be changed. And of course field lighting. So the, put, the field lighting scope uh, includes lighting at the synthetic turf field, lighting at the track and, and the soccer field um, up above, and the pathway lights to the community center. That's at about uh, 1. Well, $1.5 million. Um, this is a, a diagram of the high school site. The red area shows the, um, the impacted, essentially the two fields um, that we're cons considering um, the lights for. In terms of financing, it's very similar to what we just talked about with regard to the um, with regard to the security project. There is some money left over in a variety of capital projects. So these are projects that we have uh, are in the have or in the process of closing about seven hundred twenty thousand dollars. There um, we have a two thousand two capital reserve that would be closed out. So that's all the remaining funds in that, and that was the reserve that was used to finance the major construction at Bay Trail in the high school. Um, so that's accumulated interest in that and um, should be closed now. So so we would use this project to to accomplish that and take the remaining one point one and a half million dollars from available. Um, fund balance. And again, just as we discussed, there, there would be uh, state aid eligibility. Essentially, the, the way that state aid works is it's paid back to the district over 15 years. So the, the amount we've paid, uh, plus an assumed interest rate, is paid back over, um, over 15 years at about 75%. So that would generate a new revenue to the district of about $162,000 per year. In terms of key dates, um, the, we've been living this, as you know. So we, the, in red, you see the. Uh, we've had lots of conversation at board meetings. We've been talking about this for quite some time. But um, in the most recent key dates in red, uh, we had our public information meeting uh, on September 19th. The board had a brief conversation about that um, at the September 24th meeting. Um, and tonight, again, we'll be following up a little bit on those public comments in a couple of slides. Um, we'll discuss what we learned at that public information meeting. Um, the goals of that meeting, um, just to remind everyone, were to share the project plans and reports. So we went through 
Um, this is in what you saw tonight earlier was in summary form for that, but uh, very much the same information. We wanted to talk about the lighting study. We had pres presentations by the consultant uh, for lighting, for traffic. Uh, Mr. Shambo presented about the proposed field use. Um, we talked about the questions we'd received because by the time we got to that public information meeting, we'd, we'd received some questions. We, we knew what people wanted to talk about. We tried to address those. Um, and we got a, a wide variety of new information and, and some new questions. Um, so the, in terms of follow-up, we wanted to provide a summary of the comments and, and also talk about um, where we're at with frequently asked questions. We developed a document on that. So um, we've received comments besides the, the public comment, uh, the opportunity for public comment, at, at the uh, information meeting, we had comment cards handed out. People could, uh, if they didn't feel comfortable coming to the microphone, scribble down their, uh, their question or their comment and leave it behind. Uh, we've received comments by email and by petition. We've had um, a variety of, of <coughs> folks provide um, input. Now, in terms of um, um, Mrs. Bradstreet did an analysis of what we've received to date. So this is everything that we've received through those different mechanisms in terms of um, what folks had to say at the public information meeting, um, comment cards, all the data that, in term, that we have received to date in terms of comment. Uh, we've had 226 comments in support of the project, nine opposed to it, and four had questions but didn't really specify. They were vaguer in terms of, of what they had to say. Um, we attempted, the board has a document and received a document at your last workshop, workshop with the, um, essentially the raw data, all of the comments that were made you have. Um, but we wanted for tonight to summarize those in sort of categories. What did, were there themes, overall themes that uh, we could talk about? And you see here the main reasons that were given for supporting the project were um, uh, certainly safety of students in the community, uh, the ability to use the fields for practice and games, a sense of community pride and spirit, um, that um, we should have equal opportunities in Penfield with other districts. Um, you know, we learned that many of many of our surrounding uh, neighbors have lights, and there was a, that was a, a strong. Uh, area of comment uh, and ability to host additional events. Uh, con with regard to the people who have expressed concerns, there were concerns about noise and the impact on the neighbors to the high school, about additional traffic, about the cost, about the uh, um, impression that this seems a need rather than a, uh, or that this seems a want rather than a need. So that's, I think, the, a fair summary of the of the comments that we'd received. We've. We've included many of the questions that got answered in a frequently asked questions document. That's on the website. We've distributed pretty broadly. Um, these were a couple of the most common cost, or common, I'm sorry, common um, questions. I won't go, I'm not going to read these to you. Um, we just wanted to point these out as being sort of the frequent flyers that were addressed in the frequently asked questions. How much does it cost? What's the financing? Is it eligible for state aid? I'm not going to go over that. I just talked about it. Um, can it be put on separate propositions? We've had that uh, question and we've addressed that at um, previous board meetings. Um, and then uh, with regard to night and light and project security. So those are the sort of, of our frequently asked questions, the most common of the four or of the, of the, of the category. Um, the entire list, and we'll continue to develop and amend it as we move through this process as we, as we see the need, but it's available on our website. Um, the reports that I mentioned earlier in this, the, um, the, um, the studies with regard to lighting and traffic and so on, and much of the information that was presented at the, um, all of the information, I should say, and more uh, that was presented at the public comment periods um, there at the website. Uh, at the facilities project info tab under under the quick links. So, um, what we're aiming for now, uh, the next step, uh, in terms of our schedule and a potential schedule for this project, is we as we sit here tonight, we have a second public informational session uh, coming right up on October 15th. So, uh, it will be meeting Thursday. Um, to develop an agenda for that, but I, what I would expect it to be is some um, 
more, the, more follow up with regard to what we've learned. Um, certainly we're going to receive comments from folks um, um, about the project that have had additional time to think about it. We'll want to spend a little bit more time, um, I think, on our security project at this meeting. Um, we, um, because the first go around for public information was really focused on that athletic uh, project, we'll want to take, I think, some time here uh, to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about where we're at with security, uh, but then also to follow up uh, a little bit more with regard to the athletics and, and uh, the athletics project. By October 22nd, for this project at least, we hope to, uh, to finalize scope. We'll continue to work to refine scope uh, on security. The board will need, uh, if the board decides to go forward in November, you would be able, I think, to make a seeker determination in terms of substantial impact. Um, and then probably the earliest you would be able to go forward would be to uh, begin scheduling an election in December. So. That's um, a one possible tentative timeline. We're taking this on a step-by-step -step basis, as you know, as we work our way through. Um, so, oops. So with that, are there any other questions? Um, did the board have uh, anything else that uh, you'd like to know about where we're at with that? Thank you, Mark. Board members, questions or comments? Camille? I was wondering, um, since some of the neighbors were worried about parking on side streets and then cutting through their yards and everything, if we have a really large event, maybe a sectional event or a, there's a, a lacrosse game and a track meet or something like that, do we, I'd hate to um, take away more of our fields for parking, but do we have the option for something like that where we could have security parking people on the grass and really encouraging people to park? I know they're worried, people are parking off-site because they're worried about that congestion of trying to get out to Five Mile Line at the end of the night. But I'm just wondering if that's something we could plan ahead for so that neighbors who live there and are worried about it would know that, well, we're thinking about that, we're considering having some auxiliary parking spots over by the library on the flat area, I don't know. I just think we might need extra parking and we don't want them on the side streets. We could consider it. Uh, we haven't, to be uh, frank. The, um, we'll certainly talk about that. The, I think the issue is the one that you identified and that, that it's not that there's not adequate parking because very often, um, even when there is uh, a large event at the high school now, because as Mr. Shambo pointed out, we host, we currently host many of these events. It's just the timing mm -hmm. the, of day that we host them. Um, the, and the and we do have ad, and 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 have had adequate parking. What people I think um, take advantage of is or or reacting to is the traffic on Five Mile Line Road. It's it's in and out of the high school that's slow, um, and they want to try and advantage themselves and beat that. So um, certainly we can make more parking available, but it's not going to address that first problem. Well, you know, then, then maybe we have an opportunity just communication-wise to talk to our parents of our student-athletes and say, please be sensitive to our neighbor. You know, things like that can help, or please don't, you know, it, it, that would go a long way. Right. Just asking them to not do it and, you know, because we haven't done that in the past. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. That's the end of the superintendent's reports. All right, thank you. Board members, we are on page three of your agenda. Item five, board business. Financial items, the audit report. The annual independent audit management letter was prepared for the Board of Education by Ray Wager and was reviewed by the District Audit Committee at its October 3rd, 2013 meeting. It has also been provided to the entire board for its review. The audit contains statements for the year ending June 30th, 2013. We had a presentation by Mr. Weger here at this meeting, uh, and hopefully all your questions were answered uh, then. At this time, may I have a motion, please, that the audit by Raymond Weger, CPA, of the district's basic financial statements and the associated management letter for the year that ended June 30th, 2013, be accepted. Questions or comments? Thank you. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you. 
Audit Committee Charter. Per Commissioner's regulations, it is necessary to readopt the Penfield Audit Committee Charter each year. The Charter was reviewed and readopted with no changes by the Committee at their October 3, 2013 meeting. The Charter was given to the Board of Education prior to this meeting for review. May I have a motion, please, that the Penfield Audit Committee Charter be approved as submitted? Uh, actually, I'd like to make a comment on that, on the Charter. Well, let's get the motion on the table sure. first. So moved. Second? Second. Thank you. Questions or comments? I actually, I have a comment. One. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in, in reviewing this, uh, one thing that's, that's maybe implied but not explicit is responsibility to confirm completion of corrective action plans. The audit committee has to uh, establish and, and monitor corrective action plans, but it doesn't talk about making sure they're complete. And so I'd like to add uh, a line item to that, to that charter to say that something along the lines of confirm the completion of any corrective action plans and assist the Board of Education in verifying the effectiveness. Okay. Um, I guess um, I'm not sure where we go from here. I'm thinking, I, do we want to send approve it tonight as it is because we need to do it, I, the I, regulation? You, and you, then I mean, you have two choices, I think. Uh, I agree with the change. I, you know, I, I do think that um, it's, yeah, I think it's implied in um, the bullet point right above it. Mm -hmm. um, the board got uh, that language before tonight. But I don't think it hurts at all to be explicit about it. I think it's a healthy and useful thing. Um, you know, you could decide to send the, the um, charter back to the committee for them to reconsider and have them approve it and send it back. Um, but I, um, I think, I, I myself believe that, you know, it's, it's actually the, the, um, the bullet point immediately above that sort of addresses the same issue is review any corrective action plan developed by the school district and assist the Board of Education in the implementation of the plan. So this is more emphasis, it's more direct, it's more calling it out, but it's not different. It's not a, you're not providing a new assignment or changing the direction of the committee. And I, I believe that they'd be fine with, if you wanted to adopt the charter tonight with that changed language, um, you know, I, you have audit committee members here. Um, I don't think the committee would be offended. I, I, I think it would be just more efficient to do it that way rather than send it around and have it come back. Okay. Is the board comfortable with that? Yeah. I, I, and at least there's two of us from the audit committee here. But, yeah, and I think, um, I mean, we could do that with a, uh, you know, a, a motion to amend it with a second and vote on that amendment first and then back to the overall. I don't see us haggling over that. I think Mark's correct. There's, um, it, 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 the intent is there. I think if it helps the public to clearly understand it more than fine. Karen, any? I agree. I uh, move to amend the um, to the charter to um, reflect the comment about the I'll second that. Thank you. Um, any additional questions or comments? Thank you. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you. All right, so I guess we will get a copy of... We'll revise it and send it back out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I'm sorry, a point of order. I think you do need to now vote on the original. The original. So we voted to Thank you. make a change. Amendment. Amendment. Yeah. Thank you for catching that for me. All right, so all those in favor? The original. Thank you. Seven in favor, none opposed. Appointment. The purchasing agent will begin an extended leave soon. At this time, it is recommended that the district appoint Mr. William Maloney to serve as deputy purchasing agent. May I have a motion, please, that Mr. William Maloney be appointed deputy purchasing agent for the Penfield Central School District? Second. Questions or comments? Thank you. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you. President's remark, just some very brief remarks. I want to remind you that NISBA is coming to town, as Fred, Fred has reminded us earlier this evening. Some of us are um, registered to be there, and I believe we have a presentation from our district, from Don Bavis. Am I correct? That's correct, yes. Response to intervention. All right. So um, that should be a great opportunity for some great workshops. And you know we will uh, come back and report to you about what we have learned, hopefully. 
Um, also, next week, uh, you know, we'll see a big workshop in Fen Penfield about the Futures Committee. Um, Jim Dozier has been here a couple of times and he has presented about the Futures Committee. We've received a reminder that the deadline to register for the workshop, if you're interested in attending, is for tomorrow. So if your schedule allows you to and you don't have any other commitment, by all means, let, G um, let Jim know about it. Um, I just also wanted to say a few words about the homecoming pep rally, which was amazing. Uh, you know, I think several of us were there with administrators. It was just fantastic. And the work that was put together by the high school, um, you know, with the student, the spirit that was here on campus, I think was just wonderful. I would highly encourage the community, um, you know, if they are so inclined to you know they can watch it from the community center side probably it's it's just great to see the high school in action and all our students and everybody in their class colors i think that was just a great event i don't know if any board members would like to make additional comments about this catherine well that was the first one i attended and all of my kids are Penfield High School alumni, and I've never been to one. Of course, I wasn't allowed when they were going anyway, but <laughs> um, I really, really enjoyed it. It was, it was a beautiful day. Um, you know, the weather was great, and the spirit of the whole day was just, or the time we were there, it was just wonderful. I really enjoyed it, and I'm glad I went. So, you know, go Penfield, that's all I can say. Yeah, I think it was, it was a great pep rally and a great weekend overall as far as just uh, athletic activities that were happening. We also really enjoyed the administrators' dancing skills. I'm not going to name people, but you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, the last thing that uh, I want to remind the community is what we just talked about, and it's the October 15th public meeting. I want to remind you to please come to the public meeting. Um, it was a great turnout that we had uh, last month and it was really nice to see so many people there. Um, you know, people who just wanted to either, you know, raise their concerns or speak for the project or just share your thoughts with us. That was great. So, um, you know, I know I've had many conversations with people either on the phone or Wegmans or anything, and I want to urge these people to please come to the meeting. We really need to hear from you. We need to have a good turnout. This is your second opportunity to come and share with the board and the, administra and the administrator um, your thoughts about our project. So it's October 15th, 7 p.m., and is it still in the Commons, or are we moving to the auditorium? Uh, it's still undecided, uh, okay. but I would... I would say check the comments first, or I'd actually check the website. Okay. I think. Very the well. The auditorium was a very, very nice place to be. Jason did a wonderful job preparing it for us, so I'm inclined to go back there. All right. Very well. Thank you, Dr. Grimm. This concludes President's remarks and unfinished business. Uh, the NISPA resolutions, John? Uh, okay. On September 28th, uh, I took our uh, represented us at the NISBA proposed resolutions uh, area two discussion. There were 13 representatives there, five from Monroe County. Um, actually, they had six down, but they counted me twice. I hope that doesn't mean I spoke too much in regard to that in the minutes. I just noticed I'm down there twice. Um, everything that we had uh, agreed upon was generally agreed upon by the committee. Um, what we did see, though, those of us from Monroe County and Jody Siegel, who was there, um, as these issues become more and more predominant, uh, there is somewhat of a little bit of fracturing that goes on between large and small school districts. And that's not a surprise, but I mean, it becomes evident that there were some lengthy discussions in regard to whether um, some of the smaller school board associations, such as Fort County or Genesee Valley, uh, would support something that we would support. And um, we're fortunate enough to have David Little there, who is the uh, NISBA Director of Government Relations, and he provided a lot of clarity in regard to that. So for the most part, um, of the 13 there, only nine of us were voting members, so uh, everything was pretty much approved, and we'll move on and to the delegate meeting um, at the end of the uh, convention. Okay. Um, legislative update. 
Okay. Beyond that? Um, before that, any, any questions, questions or comments for John regarding the Nespa resolutions? All right, thank you. So, a new business legislative update. Uh, you have in your packet, uh, and, and as you see in the back of your packet, a couple of more of the resolutions, the white papers that the Monroe County School Boards Association has put forward. Um, just briefly, student health and fitness, uh, controller audit, something I know Mark is always anxious to hear about, and charter schools. And I think the common theme you see in all of these are the words unfunded mandates. And uh, as we just had tonight, a, a great audit, and Ray mentioned at the audit committee meeting, um, you know, we're, we're on top of it with our audit, but unbeknownst, someone could just come around and tell Mark, stop everything, we're going to have an audit from New York State. And um, there, there's just a lot of clarity that needs to be done. And of course, in most cases, these are done because of a problem with some school district somewhere in time. So um, again, with charter schools, it's an issue of fairness. But I think the, the common word is unfunded mandates and fairness as you look at these. Um, I know the um, president's group of the Monroe County School Boards Association this week. Uh, are you meeting this week? Tomorrow. We Tomorrow have we'll get yes. our uh, most recent white paper or position paper in regard to uh, what we're calling uh, the governor's death penalty statement, where he had mentioned that you know if if you're not gonna if if your school isn't gonna work, I'm gonna use my authority and. Uh, take over your school board, send your school board members away, and, uh, you know, apparently they'll live happily ever after. And that's not something we believe in. And one of the emphasis of this uh, that you'll see in that white paper, which I think has been distributed, um, we're elected officials as well. And uh, if he wants to start removing some legislative bodies, that's one thing, but you know, let's not just pick on one elected body versus another. So there's a constitutionality issue that I've talked about before, but we reviewed the white paper, we've re-reviewed it, and I think what you'll get tomorrow night will be the final document that everybody was, is in agreement upon that is more of a fact sheet and an actual sheet on what the reality is and that I don't see the organizations backing down. Uh, on the other side of it, though, we don't see the governor backing down as well. So usually that ends up in the legislature. So um, we'll keep our efforts going. But this is going to be a key issue among many issues um, when the legislature goes back in session in January. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. yeah I, I would like to say that, um, you know, it's one thing for the governor to say through your you know, gross mishandling or mismanagement of, you know, how you're conducting your school and uh, you're failing and therefore I'm going to give you the death penalty. That's one thing. It's another thing to see schools, um, you know, suffer or struggle or whatever due to underlying problems like poverty or uh, social issues that have a great deal to do with failing schools. So I'm glad that the efforts are are proceeding and I want to see that continue because I think that's extremely important and it should be noted too that there's underlying problems that are causing school problems and it's just so easy to say well if you don't do a good job we're just going to take you down or take you out and um, I don't think we should stand for that. All right. thank you. Any additional comments or questions for John? All right, thank you. This concludes our new business. May I have a motion, please, that the meeting be adjourned at 9.15 p.m.? Thank you. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Seven in favor. None opposed. Thank you.